Heat is a great way to see if proteins are interacting with one another, but their figures can get quite complicated. So here is a guide and some practice to interpreting some simple ones, um, as well as some advice for when they get more complicated. This is part of a longer video with more on CoIP and other antibody-based methods that I will link to if people want to know more about the method itself. But today, let's talk about interpreting the figures. You're typically, what you'll see is on the left, you'll see an input lane. Um, basically, this is just showing you what they put in. So if you, this is important because, well, if you, there wasn't any of your bait in the sample, how are you going to see if it's in the pull down? Or if there was a lot of the, a lot of one protein in the input, and then you see a little bit of it pulled down, then that, that's a lot um, less significant than if there's a little tiny bit of it in your input and then like all of that is still in your pull down. Um, so the input's important to kind of be able to compare, okay, well, how much was there to start with versus how much of it actually gets pulled down. It's also important to have a negative control. Um, so this might be like a pull down with naked beads. Um, so with beads without antibody bound or with beads with an antibody for something that you know is not in the mixture, um, such as something um, like for our mouse or targeting a different protein that you're not looking for, various things like this. Um, so this is important to show that, yeah, your antibody is actually specific and your washes are sufficient. So we'll talk more about washes in a second, um, but that's what you'll see. So you have your input, what's going in, your negative control, and then your pull down. Um, sometimes this is like labeled like IP. And basically this is going to be the stuff that was pulled down when you isolated that bait, the prey. So you'll see the bait as well as whatever prey it was bound to. Okay, so let's get some practice interpreting one of these blocks. What you'll typically see is something like this. On top, you'll see this sort of table with pluses and minuses. And then on the left, there's going to be, you'll see the input. And on the right, you'll see um, the IP. So this is your pull down. And so here, they're specifically telling us that they're doing a pull down against HA. Now over here, they're saying that in the samples, basically the, the samples differ. So this one, flag glue A1, this is a receptor, basically that has an epitope tag, a flag tag. And then they also have HAPRRT1, um, which is some sort of other protein that has this HA tag. So they have two tagged proteins. They're going to be doing their immunoprecipitation against the HA. So basically they're going to be pulling out this HAPRRT1, and then they're going to be doing an antibody again. They're using an immunoblot, so a Western blot, both against the flag tag, which will tell them if blue A1 is there, as well as against the HA, which will tell them if PRRT1 is there. Um, and so in one of their samples, they have the flag blue A1, but not the HA PRRT1. And in the other sample, they have both of them. And so you'll see the same, you should see the same like thing in the input and in the IP in terms of the table above, what they're putting in. Um, but then what they see with their amino precipitation might be different. So whenever you're doing an amino precipitation against something, you should see that something in your, in your amino precipitation if it was present in your input. So basically here, what we're saying is, okay, we're gonna be doing our IP against HA. In this first sample, we don't have any HA, so we shouldn't expect to see any of it in our IP. And in fact, we don't, so that's good. Kind of like a negative control. Okay, now what's gonna happen is if we look, think, look about glue A1. So we can see that in both of these samples, we have our glue A1, but are we going to see it in our pull down? Well, we're pulling down the HA, so the only way that we'll see glue A1 is if it's actually interacting with our HA. And so do we see glue A1? Well, we have to look and see, okay, they're immunoblotting against the flag because that flag is going to tell us about glue A1. So we can see here that yes, we don't, we, we see that, we see the HA, which is good because, well, that's what we're pulling out. And so we wanna make sure we can see it and um, that we actually are pulling it out. And we also see this glue A1. And so this is telling us that these two proteins were interacting. What about in this case? Here we're looking at a different receptor, this glue A2, but the, the rest is the same. 
how do we interpret this? Are they interacting or not? Right, this is similar to before. We can see that they're interacting because we see both of them in our pull down. Let's look at a couple more examples. So here they're looking at glue A3 and glue A4. Yeah, they look pretty similar to before. We can see that they're both interacting. We can also see that they have some non-specific bands in here. Um, and so they need to be a little careful um, with their interpretation, but they still have a lot more signal than they have with this non-specific signal. Um, so yes, we can say that they do seem to be interacting. Okay, what about this one though? This blue A1 with this PRRT2. So now we're looking at a different protein interacting. Do we see interaction here? Yeah, so basically there's a little, little tiny bit, um, but this interaction must not be nearly as strong. There might be a weak association, a weak interaction, um, but not nearly as much as in our other cases. So finally, they have this other um, negative control. We're here, they wanna see, okay, well, is PRRT1 just like randomly binding everything? And so they choose this other random protein, NRXN1, which it shouldn't be binding to. And they want to see, okay, well, if the binding is really, really nonspecific, then we would be expecting to see NRXN1 if the, if the um, it, or if our wash conditions were so bad that basically things were just all sticking together and everything was there, we would expect to see it. But if things are good, if our binding is specific, then we don't expect to see NRXN1 when we pull down PRRT1. So in fact, when they pull down PRRT1, well, now what they see is basically they're not going to see NRXN1. So they pull down the PRRT1 through the, to the HA tag, and then they do a Western blot to the flag tag, to look for NRX in one and they don't see it. So this is how you would interpret something like this. Do you, how do you think their results might have been different if they had done a higher salt concentration? How might those salt concentrations of the washes affect what gets detected? Think about what you know about intermolecular forces. Right, the interactions are gonna be weaker. And so we might see fewer detections, we might see fewer proteins detected, and we might see lower amounts of those that are detected. Remember that even for non-permanent charges, even non-ionic interactions, we can still think about them as on some level being partially charged based. Well, what's gonna happen is if you have high salt concentrations, you're gonna have lots of your ions floating around. And those ions are kind of gonna create this fogginess, this electric fogginess that's gonna kind of distract the binding partners, um, compete for those binding interactions. It's going to make it harder for those charges to feel one another. It's gonna make those interactions weaker. And so the higher the salt washes, the, more, the stronger the affinity has to be for things to stay bound. No matter how complex these figures get, the key is to look, see where you see a differences, like spot the difference. Where you spot the difference, then go above that place in the blot, look up and see what's in the table, what's missing, what's there. Um, and when you see like, okay, a band disappears if I don't have this present, well, that tells you that, well, you need that component present in order to have this interaction. And if you take away that component and you still see the band, well, this is telling you that that component isn't needed for that interaction. And so no matter how complicated these things are, go look, go see, spot the difference, look up in the table and see what's there and what's not there. And hope this helps you understand these figures.